So would this morning's speakers come up and uh, sit at the table? We'll have a now kind of an open panel discussion. Uh, what? Okay, good. Yeah, I have one as well. So if I may, um, I'm Ian Krachunas, member of the organizing committee, and um, Kim and I were chatting, and this is consistent with discussions that we've had in the past. We'd like to um, pose a little opening question challenge to our speakers here, with apologies for springing this on you right before you sat down for your panel. Um, one thing we were hoping that this meeting did is really um, help us think about what a possible path forward might be and really think about it in an integrated way. What are the ways we can bring together measurements and models and really uh, tackle this problem moving forward? So our question is, if you were appointed the Uber program manager for uh, reducing aerosol cloud interaction uncertainty over the next decade, 15, 20 years, with carte blanche, so 50, 100 million dollars, pick your number, um, what one thing would you do? It can be as narrow as you like, it could be as broad as you like, but um, within the spirit of integration, bonus points if you're uh, able to articulate something that would not directly benefit you or your group, <laughs> Double bonus points if you're a modeler, if you stay at measurement, <laughs> and vice versa, right? Uh, and triple bonus points if you can do it in like three sentences or less. <laughs> Gauntlet. What does the winner get? <laughs> Free dinner. Fifty million dollars. Oh, <laughs> oh. It's kind of going fast. Who wants to? Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I just trying to fill Go the ahead, gap. Rob. Uh, I don't know. I haven't thought. Uh, I guess what I'd do probably is bring these bring these communities more closely together, so that we're doing apples and apples comparisons. So, um, which there were some great examples of how we might go to that in, in, in future. It's, it's a hard problem because, you know, if you go into the CMIP 5 archives, you find that nearly all the data, a lot of the data there is monthly means. Um, so then, are we, how do you compare a monthly mean, just take a cloud aerosol relationship? How do you compare that with a mo between a model and some field program data? Uh, it, it's kind of, it, it becomes very difficult. So I think developing ways to in better integrate modeling and observations so that people are looking at modelers are producing data that's more relevant for the observations and the observationalists also have a responsibility to better make their data more meaningful for comparison with obs models is, is probably a good start. So when we design a field experiment now, do, do we do any modeling to, to do we do any uh, modeling of the scenario to see, yeah, in advance. No, probably not really. Uh, so I would say that we probably won't want to model the observational. You know, doing it's not observing system simulation exactly, but it's something like that. But for for field experiments, I think it's really important to do. We're just just not doing it. I would say. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go straight from my two bonus points and say this has to all, all has to do with measurements. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think we need to spend more time using the measurements we have and, and really extracting the, the, the real knowledge from them. I, I just don't think we've done that. I, we keep making more and more and more measurements and they're not always very well designed and we're making long-term measurements in places where we probably already know a lot about the aerosol, if you're, if you're thinking just about the aerosol. And, um, I think we need to really think what we've got and 
uh, if I was a program manager, I would have a program of data exploitation. Five years of just really refining how we extract the marrow from uh, existing measurements and just have a pause in, in collecting measurements because you can see how it's gone up. We've collected more and more and more and it, the, the uncertainty hasn't gone down. So let's just have a pause and see what we can learn from what we've already got because measurements are expensive. Models are also quite expensive if you put the right effort into them. But do we, cheap. we could... Uh, cheap. Well, not when I run them, uh, these big ensembles. <laughs> you only need one run. I need uh, hundreds, as you know. So. <laughs> Now we need to, to confront, bring these two together. I'm essentially saying the same thing as, as Rob said. We need to bring the two together right, in, in a more intensive way. And that's not, that's not cheap. That's a lot of personnel time to extract. We're trying to do this in the UK with uh, the Manchester group right now with the, with the aerosol. It's a big job to bring models together with observations intensively. So I, I would do that. Um, I basically follow up and what the previous speaker said. Uh, essentially, we need to spend a lot of time to understand the data, to understand what it's telling us and in combination with the models, figure out what's the extractable information. And from there on, define either new campaigns or new data sort of types to measure that are not covering sort of what we're measuring right now. I think we have a, a, a lot of coverage of specific types of knowledge. We have some glaring gaps and we just need to sit down and think better where sort of we should invest our time and efforts. Uh, I guess I would uh, second the, the need for uh, using uh, the data better, and I think we can only know from the models how, how to use the data, how to construct these emergent constraints that we're looking in, looking for. I, I guess, um, I think we've seen many examples of cases where we know something physically where somehow that information is either not getting into models or it's getting in in a garbled way. And I think we should really recognize the complexity of what we're trying to do in GCMs here. And you know, if I had $50 million, I would certainly invest some of it in, um, in really trying to upscale uh, very high resolution models where we uh, can look at cloud aerosol interaction on sort of more point by point basis without having to worry so much about subgrid variability. So, you know, cloud, global cloud resolving models, near global LES, that kind of model I think uh, is an important benchmark to add to the mix here. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, being last, I can second what everyone else said. But uh, I agree that we have a lot of observations, but a lot of them are surface observations. And we can learn things from that, and maybe they haven't been exploited to the extent that they need to be. But we also have a real gap of what happens in the free troposphere, where really a lot of the action happens in terms of what's getting ingested into clouds. So I would like to uh, maybe in, in concert with modelers and looking at specific cases where we really think there's going to be some impact, try to design a study where we look at vertical distributions and what controls them and try to understand them better. Okay. Bram, did you want to? Okay, well, since I raised my hand, I, um, <laughs> one of the thoughts I had to Giraffe's point about modeling before field experiments, uh, and you not, not talking about RCs, would be the issue of perhaps uh, simulating uh, where you would get the most benefit from placing instruments uh, in the field campaign. Uh, I know this was done, for example, years and years ago uh, when our group was putting wind profilers uh, in place for a field experiment. When, and it was, in fact, it was Monterey Bay. Um, and one could do some modeling to decide where the wind profilers would best be placed to get benefit. And, and uh, I think that, that that's sort of the approach. Yeah, I, I mean, that's kind of what we, we do that. Uh, I was looking back to when I worked for the Met Office, and if they put a new radio sun station in, well, really, they close them down. So as they close them down, uh, <laughs> they, don't put, they don't put new ones in. Uh, so as they close them down, they do a lot of experimentation with the model to see what is the impact of that measurement and what's gonna, how is it going to uh, detriment the forecast. So I think we should be doing that to understand things like precipitation susceptibility with models. Is, is the precipitation susceptibility as we measure it in the field, and this would depend on placement of sensors, 
is it actually telling us about the sensitivity of the precipitation to aerosols, or is it telling us about maybe co-varying meteorology? I mean, we need those kind of questions can be answered with modeling, I think, ahead of going into the field. So okay. yeah, I'm kind of agreeing with you. First, Danny, and then Ron. The importance of uh, CCN and other drafts that explain 90% of the variability of uh, low concentration. Uh, so, if uh, you, get, you give me so much money, why not uh, uh, venture and uh, try to uh, get uh, satellite measurements of both uh, uh, properties and, and see if that is attainable? Uh, yeah, much of the focus has been on the top of that. Independent of that, aerosols that do the dipping changes the hydrological cycle. And also, that means that these models change the vertical distribution of the vacuum. And we want to target the impact on the climate and the top of that is very important. So I'm wondering where there are the markets in terms of simulating that and comparing that with each other. Is that a question for us? I can say that IPCC has black carbon's the biggest aerosol direct forcing in the, in the model, right? In, across the models. So I don't know whether that's good, but it certainly suggests that they're capturing a, some of that absorbing aerosol pretty effectively. I mean, I don't know whether they're doing it correctly, but it's it's in the models. Oh. Yeah. I have a question for Ken. Uh, <clears throat> in your nature paper, you showed the importance of the, the pre-industrial atmosphere, the pre-industrial condition of the state. And then you went on to examine the question, are there areas of the earth in present day that are close to pre-industrial conditions? Do you want to comment on where you think that stands and how that might be used? Yeah, so um, I was talking to this about uh, with Danny on the bus actually with the, the value of knowing where we should go that's pristine and um, I think when we, me let, let me open that question up a bit. So when, when we measure the relationship between aerosols and, and clouds, we the, the aerosol goes right down to really low values and the cloud drop number goes right down to really low values and, the, and they go right up to really high values and we see the full range and most of that range is probably at the low end is probably driven by precipitation it's a local process that's driving the aerosol and the cloud drop number down um, but when we want the pre-industrial to present day forcing we want to know what the clouds were doing in, in an in a aerosol state that's climatologically low not just low because it happened to have rained a little bit earlier. So I don't think we've got a good understanding for how present-day cloud systems would respond if we could somehow impose on them climatologically low aerosol. So I think we, should, we can go to parts of the world where aerosol is climatologically low and look at the aerosol behavior and make sure models are behaving like these clouds are in these, in these uh, regions. Um, and there are not many regions left that we can go to just to observe that, the remote southern ocean and there's uh, parts of the Pacific, and there's a few other well, hot spots. But the question really is, are the cloud systems there representative of, what we, of the regions where we need to know the forcing? We need to know over the North Atlantic, but of course we can't observe a pristine North Atlantic now. Mm. I think we mustn't be misled into thinking we can just observe low aerosol concentrations in the North Atlantic. That's not the same to me as climatologically low aerosol concentrations that you would have had in the pre-industrial. So I think it's a question of how we learn from clean regions. I think we need to be careful. That paper was really saying, this is where these regions are. We didn't have the solution about how we could learn to actually reduce the forcing on that basis. So I'm interested to know what people like Rob think about what I've just said, really, about climatologically low aerosol being different from just locally low aerosol. Um, I guess um, you make a good point. Um, but I think we do, so in the spirit of, uh, the meteorology being identical from the pre-industrial realization in the present day, if in the present day the aerosols are being scrubbed out heavily uh, by some process upstream, I'm going to talk about this a little bit this afternoon, then um, 
presumably that would also happen in the pre-industrial. Um, so, so there are some, I guess what I'm saying is that I think there are some reasons to, to study low CCN environments um, simply because they would probably be also low, they, they're low in, if they're low in the present day, they probably would have been low in the pre-industrial as well. And so they are telling you about the process, they're telling you about the sync processes that we seem to agree are important for setting the background state in the pre-industrial. Uh, but yeah, they're not telling you, I, I think getting a forcing out of that is very difficult. Yeah, again, I think it's, it's instructive a little to look at the cloud feedbacks uh, analogy here. Um, so uh, again, you know, one way to try and deduce what future cloud feedbacks would be would be to look at the present day and look at variability in the present day. And so people have tried to do this. People like uh, Andy Dessler, for instance, tried to look at month-to-month -month variability from satellites in global cloud cover and uh, and top of atmosphere radiation and, and and global temperature and see if there was you know any any relationship that could be found between these and what was quickly realized was you know as I think Ken is pointing out that the relationships aren't the same but and so initially that was very discouraging but then more recent studies have shown that there still is a correlation between the the two uh, things the uh, the month to month variability of clouds and its relation to temperature in a model and its cloud feedbacks, its relationship to temperature over, um, over longer time scales. And that, that relationship is, is maybe useful enough that we can learn something from the observational record. So, um, you know, I certainly think it's worth looking at this high frequency, high frequency variability, daily variability, or at least monthly variability, and trying to understand just within models how it's correlated. Um, uh, with with the well with aerosol indirect effect. Ralph. So yeah, I just want to go back to the first question about what we would do. Um, I think it would be worthwhile to not only consider where to make field measurements, but also what suite of field measurements would be the most effective ones to do. Now we, we recently did an exercise of this sort for direct aerosol radiator forcing and came up with a list of 15 things that need to be measured. And in fact, in none of the field campaigns in the past have we had that entire suite of measurements made simultaneously in the same place. So for indirect effects, it's going to be more ambitious and you're going to need that $150 million or whatever it is that you guys were offering for future measurements. <laughs> But the exercise of sitting down from first principles and saying what is the capturing suite of measurements that would need to be made in order to understand the mechanisms in a given location and the parameters that are associated with those mechanisms, I think that's an exercise that I'm pretty sure hasn't been done. And I think it's pretty revealing. Okay, so a couple of thoughts. One is going back to this question of pre-industrial that you raised, um, pristine conditions. And I think the question is, to a great extent, not just what those pristine conditions are, but what the convolution of pristine conditions uh, is with the pre-industrial meteorology. We, we, I think we're, we're letting the clouds uh, slip away every now and then, and Chris keeps pulling us back for a good reason. You know, what, what do the clouds look like in, in this pre-industrial world? And, um, and, and knowing the convolution, spatial, spatial temporal interaction between those is something that you really um, don't know much about. And again, I guess it goes to the cloud feedback issue because uh, it's almost like we need to be working backwards instead of uh, projecting forward. What if we were now to go in back towards a low um, CO2 atmosphere? Uh, you know, what would, I'm not sure to, that this is a symmetric reversible uh, state, but if we were to go back to the um, very low CO2 pristine conditions, uh, would we be able to get the meteorology uh, and the aerosol uh, right now? Because that, that doesn't change the fact that we still wouldn't be able to have any observations to <laughs> 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 Anyway, I'm just talking about the 
but I, I, I think it's the meteorology of the aerosol and the fact that we need to all focus on the clouds. So, so Brian, how would you know? No, that was my, my last point, because you wouldn't well, I think know. That's, I think that's the key point. You wouldn't know. Why would you go back? You wouldn't know the clouds work. You wouldn't know how the logistics they work. I think we can only go forward. Agree. No, I, I think it was just sort of a, 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 an afterthought while I was formulating the question. I'm not suggesting one necessarily does that. But I think that uh, running our simulations with pristine conditions right now uh, isn't enough. We don't know what the cloud fields, how they differed in, in the pre-industrial meteorology. Exactly. This is my point earlier, that you, we don't have a measurement to compare against. So all we can do is, as Ralph was saying, use as many measurements as we currently have to constrain the model state and behavior. And we haven't really done that in a systematic way. That's why I said I would use that money to bring measurements and models together in a more consistent way, a big concerted effort. It's surprising how little that's been done. I mean, Aerocom does it a bit. Most of Aerocom actually has been about intercomparing models. And laterally, it's about being comparing models with, with measurements. But they've only really scratched the surface. A tiny amount of data has been used in, in Aerocom. And then there are other initiatives as well where data sets have been used very effectively, but we could do a lot more of that. As, and as I'd say, throw away implausible models. Uh, it's, uh, to me, the only way we'll do it. Then we won't know what the forcing is for sure, but at least we'll have one that we know is consistent with our measurement systems. So on that topic, if I may, I think one of the difficulties is, and you were saying, let's, let's take a pause here and not uh, keep taking more. Uh, I don't think you were saying let's not take more data, but let's at least look carefully at what we have. One of my concerns is that over the course of time, the instruments have changed, mm. the quality of the measurements has changed, and certainty of the measurements themselves have changed. And so that probably drives many people to keep going out and making better measurements. Um, do we need to standardize? Is it better to have uh, an instrument with, with known flaws and just have more standardized measurements, um, and, and lots of them, uh, as opposed to just keep refining producing better No, I think the refinements are really valuable, but we still haven't extracted the, the essence from the existing measurements. We tend to just do a case study and then move on. There's a lot more information there. I th and I think the same is true of the models. I feel that, you know, most 95% of all climate-related clou cloud modeling, I'm uh, sorry, climate modeling exercises probably use monthly mean data, right? So there's a responsibility for observationists to, and modelers to, to, to look at what more can be extracted from these models. How can we better use them? So the example that Chris gave this morning, where they're using the single color model to compare directly with the LES, you know, you know that, that doesn't get done that often. You know, I think we need to do more of that. Well, I should say in that regard, it's a a resource that is available right now for many of the, C, um, the CMIP models is this data called CF sites data, and it basically encompasses many of the different locations around the world at which we do point measurements, you know, things like the arm sites, et cetera. Um, and at those sites, there are special data sets where model output is written out every three hours and is available as long time series for people to analyze. And so um, there are also resources right now to do some of these additional studies. Maybe we should stop doing um, CMIP type big evaluations and uh, put more effort into process-based evaluation of these models because we haven't made progress. So we just keep churning out the same old stuff. I just feel we could be a bit more focused if we really want to tackle that problem of uncertainty reduction. It's not going to happen just by no. throwing huge resources into these big, long flagship runs that the modeling centers do and bring them together for an IPCC report yeah. every six years. It's not, I'm, I mean, it's not every, developing our knowledge. Okay. Every five well, years, six months of development, basically, for the next generation models. Yeah. I mean, it's, okay. that's Let, actually very frustrating. Let me yeah. we'll go to Ron. Um, I have two questions that are interrelated. Um, one is, given the current GCMs, uh, you know, take the best one, that's uh, the best one there, uh, what is the Even or what's the met place where we can be taking place, do we actually have a strategy for doing our 
before you know we dump on either the measurements or the models. That's number one. And number two is given the amount of money that's been put in front of you, is it possible to actually drive towards some kind of a benchmark? Call it whatever you may, cloud revolving model uh, or LES, global LES model, such that we actually you know, remove this finite domain issue that, that arises for LES and cloud scale models and actually think of making them both. Uh, given you know where uh, computers are going, and given the fact that we seem to have many more measurements of lots of parameters, is actually possible to think of benchmark models in the future. So, can I just make one comment about that? I like that idea, and there are a couple of strategies for doing it, but they're not quite as obvious. So, for instance, one that we're exploring uh, in collaboration with Mike Pritchard right here is something ultra-parameterization, which basically, like super-parameterization, so in other words, you're running a fine resolution model in every column of a course, uh, of a global um, model, but you use 100-meter uh, horizontal resolution, 20-meter vertical, or 200-meter horizontal, 20-meter vertical resolution. So this actually could explore a lot of turbulent aerosol cloud interactions. And of course, the Japanese are already running global models down to um, and down to a sub one kilometer scale for a few days. And I think one thing to say about this is that if you have a model like that, um, it doesn't necessarily take a very long integration to learn a lot. You can probably learn a heck of a lot about cloud aerosol interactions with a two week integration. So, how are you going to initialize aerosol? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, it, you need long enough, I think, so, so two weeks was deliberately chosen to give one week at least for things to start spinning up and, and, and run the RSL sort of through the global hydrologic cycle and, uh, and then another week to actually believe it. But I don't think it necessarily takes that long. I, I don't think you should assume you need years of data if you do account for meteorology. And, and I think especially if you use nudge meteorology, even in this kind of study, I think uh, then you have a better standard for comparing it. So, Michael? Thank you, John. Um, I don't really think the community has gotten their heads around trying to use climate models to evaluate a campaign data. We've always failed. High casting barely works. We really don't have a strategy for how you take a measurement over a brief time and run a climate model and compare it. And I really, that's the fundamental problem with all of this. And what's interesting is there's no way to tell skill. So what's, this is like an aerosol climate model. There's a meeting in Europe on aerosol air quality. What they're doing is they're actually doing integrated forecast modeling with detailed aerosols and I hope that they get precip done right and they actually have skill tests. I don't think we're anywhere near that on the global models. I think you know potentially looking at what you can get with you know short-term forecast and integrating the processes and aerosol might be a way to actually go fairly far forward. Okay, let's uh, see it's who is Oh, oh, sorry. I just wanted to respond to basically a number of these comments that in some of the global modeling centers, there's been two efforts over the last couple of years. One of them is we have come a long way towards better comparisons between observations and models, the apples to apples comparisons, getting back to the drops at the beginning. That's been done both through things like satellite simulators and other instrument simulators. Um, where we actually try to represent the uncertainties in the instruments, even if they're old instruments in the models. And the other is mechanisms that Michael was talking about, some of the other people were talking about, to do campaign-based comparisons, where you nudge models or do short-term forecasts, and they can be done with the processes that are in global models or small-scale models. And to bring those to the observations, so that you can actually compare the same sort of set up meteorological conditions, do assimilations, basically get these things together. And that's proven fruitful at the process-based level for then understanding the short time scale things that can be done. And we're starting to do that. We're starting to develop techniques for that. I think more can be done in that regard to kind of bring these things together as a strategy to do both small scale and large scale modeling and use the observations we already have in sort of a hindcast framework. Both of the, you know, the gets from the process level all the way up to the global level is going to be done. So I think there are ways of bringing things together that are being developed. Okay.
With that, thanks everyone. It's time for lunch. We'll see you back.